afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth webinar of the 2022-2023 EMOS webinars program. My name is Caterina Giusti. I'm a professor of statistics at the University of Pisa in Italy, and as a member of the EMOS team of my university, I'm working at the organization of this webinar program on behalf of Eurostat, together with the German company Startup. Today, I will act as the webinar moderator. Now, let me first explain for any newcomers that EMO stands for the European Master in Official Statistics, a joint project of universities and data producers in the EU member states, EFTA, and EU candidate countries. If your university is interested in applying for the EMOS label, please consider that a permanently open call for universities is available on the EMOS dedicated page on the Eurostat website. For staying in contact with the EMOS news and community, please follow the EMOS on Twitter. The Twitter handle is at EU underscore EMOS. It's now time to start for, uh, with our webinar. Before I give the floor to our speaker, let me first deeply explain how we run the webinar today. As you can see this here, the EMOS webinar stream on Zoom. The webinar is recorded, and the recording will be uploaded on the EMOS YouTube channel, where you can already find the recording of the past webinars, as well as the past two EMOS workshops. As a participant, you can watch and listen to the webinar. You can also use the Q&A manager to pose your question to the presenter during the webinar. Our speaker will be answering your question on two occasions during today's webinar, one time during the speech, and I will be launching, announce this uh, um, break, and one and at the final part of the final discussion. Should you have any technical problem or question, please send a message in the chat and you will be contacted by one of the members of the technical staff. So today I have the great pleasure to host Professor Walter Rademacher. Professor Rademacher was Director General of Eurostat and Chief Statistician of the European Union from 2008 to 2016. He worked at the Statis, the German Federal Statistical Office for 30 years, ultimately as its president. He was the first chair of the United Nations Committees of Experts on Environmental Economic Accounting from 2005 to 2008, and member of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's High Level Expert Group on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress from 2013 to 2018. Since 2017, he has been a researcher at the Department of Statistical Science at the Sapienza University of Rome and the president on FENSTATS the Federation of European National Statistical Societies. And since 2020, he has been a lecturer in the International Program in Survey and Data Science at Mannheim University. And since 2022, he's also chair of the International Statistical Institute Advisory Board on Ethics and honorary professor at the Statistical Institute of the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. So, Today, Professor Rademacher will be presenting about statistics for the public good. So now is the time to you to take the floor. <laughs> so thank you very much, Katarina, and good afternoon or good day um, to all the participants. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, in the EMOS course um, the uh, issue of statistics for the public good. And it's very close to my heart because the, the very, how to say, uh, creation of EMOS uh, was um, based on an initiative by myself, which I brought from Germany to the European level. So it was a dream already in, when I was working in Germany uh, to have a European master in official statistics, and here we are. So uh, we have learned a lot, and uh, now it's a pleasure for me to contribute. I would like to share my screen. Uh, and Katarina, it's, it's fine. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, so um, you see here the uh, the entry place of the Munich University. This is the place where I'm currently um, affiliated to. And the webinar will be structured in five parts. Um, the first two are um, more or less on the state side, on the, the user side of uh, evidence statistical information. And the, the last, uh, the, the next two ones uh, are more on the statistics side itself. And uh, in the fifth part, I will come back to, how to say, the, the dialectics between uh, evidence, uh, value creation and value appreciation. So looking at the problem from both sides. Um, and 
Um, I will start with a slide with German language. Madame Faeser, Nancy Faeser, is the current minister for the interior. And uh, the, the sentence is saying in English, uh, statistics is the central basis for um, acting and uh, deciding of the state, staatliches Handeln. And this was said uh, on 20th January 2023, uh, when the new president of the German statistical office was introduced by her. So I thought that is a good, uh, let's say, hors d'oeuvre uh, for my talk, uh, that the, the minister uh, herself appreciates uh, how important statistics is for, let's say, the entire decision making and acting of the state. Uh, something similar, but in a more negative, critical way, was said by the UN uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres two years ago, uh, or three years ago now or, already. Um, and he said, well, uh, our common enemy is COVID, but our enemy is also an infodemic or misinformation. And this is something we have really to consider um, because there is a lot of statistics out there. And when the um, Secretary General of the UN is so critical uh, in the assessment of the contribution of statistics and um, information, uh, then we really have an issue and we have a problem to fix on our side. Um, and what I will use to give us a little bit of orientation and not to be drowned in some, let's say, sectoral uh, discussions of this statistics or that statistics, um, I think it is good to have a kind of a general perspective uh, for uh, giving answer to the question, what will come as information need to statistics in the next three, four, five, seven or eight years? And I think um, if, if this is the question, uh, then one has to uh, acknowledge that all our states have signed up to a strategy of the United Nations towards 2030, um, which is called sustainable development. So I think having this in mind, uh, I will have a look at this kind of general overall atmosphere and let's say reading and interpreting what will come in the next years and, and what do we have to prepare in order to avoid a situation as it was in the beginning of COVID in 2020. So better prepared for the crisis and the information needs to come. And um, well, the, the, the point is that um, uh, sustainable development is by far not a new concept. It was already introduced at the begin at the end of the 1980s by the Brundtland uh, Commission and the Rio conference in 1992, um, where uh, the people have said, uh, well, in order uh, for decision making to be based on information, we need to bridge the data gap and we have to improve information availability. So this is 30 years ago. And um, today um, we can ask ourselves what are the, let's say, the pertinent risks which we will face in the next two years or in the next 10 years. And here um, some, let's say, a guidance is given by the Global Risk Report uh, of the World Economic Forum. And they say for the next two years, we will have inflation, cost of living crisis. We will have natural disasters. Uh, we have conflicts and wars, geoeconomic confrontation. And for the next 10 years, the picture changes. Uh, so for the next 10 years, we will have uh, climate change, climate change adaptation, Again, extreme weather events, biodiversity loss. This is quite interesting because in official statistics, uh, it takes not, uh, let's say, a couple of days or weeks. It takes sometimes years uh, before a new product is mature enough um, to be provided by a statistical institution. So we have to look at mainly at these um, collection of uh, meta risks and meta themes, uh, which will uh, confront us with new information needs in the next coming years. And what is also interesting from this report of the World Economic Forum is that all these risks are interconnected. 
So it's not that we have here green risks and that it would be sufficient to, uh, to, to improve environment statistics. Or um, it's not uh, that we have here social risks and that it is sufficient um, to improve social statistics. No, the challenge of the future will be um, that we have to, uh, to, to support with evidence uh, the, the design of transition processes which connect, um, let's say, biodiversity loss with erosion of social, social cohesion. So this is, for example, in the new uh, agricultural program of the EU, um, this is what we will uh, see, um, that we have to answer questions from both sides, from the green and from the social side, so to say. Um, uh, from a scientific perspective, I think this is the um, widely accepted reading uh, that we have to face planetary boundaries uh, and that there are major risks uh, which are already exceed, exceeding uh, the planetary bound, boundaries of, um, our, of our planet. And this is not climate change. Climate change is very risky, but uh, interestingly, biosphere integrity, uh, so biodiversity loss and biogeochemical flows are the highest risks in this kind of uh, watch um, uh, of planetary boundaries. And if you ask ourselves, uh, if you ask ourselves, what is out there in official statistics exactly here and here, then it's very, very poor. So uh, we have a lot of uh, things to say on freshwater use or land uh, system change, but biodiversity and biochemical um, flows, um, the box of official statistics is almost empty, unfortunately. So we have to do something. Now, uh, looking at indicators, not statistics, but now uh, particularly on indicators, uh, the 2015 uh, decision on the sustainable development goals at the same moment of time had broken down uh, to 17 goals here in different colors and 169 targets. This is already a lot. And then the statistical community was asked to come up with indicators um, for the targets and the goals. And now all in all, we have 231, 231 indicators. And you may ask yourself whether this is a meaningful, uh, let's say, advice to <laughs> political decision makers if you come up with a dashboard with more than 200 indicators. So um, this is cannot be the end of the story and we have to do better in my, in, in my opinion. So we cannot leave it up completely to the diplomats and the decision makers uh, to sort it out which of the indicators are important for them or not. So, but um, here we have uh, the indicators report, for example, from the UN. And um, now in the, let's say, the most possible condensed way, uh, one could say um, we put together a diagram, sorry, uh, where we uh, ask ourselves, uh, where are countries? on one scale, which gives us an information about the number of social thresholds achieved. So if you are here, then you have zero social threshold achieved. Here you have one, here you have four, uh, and here you have eight social thresholds. So this is poverty, it's education and all these things. And here you have the number of biophysical boundaries transgressed. So whether, when it was when it is good to be high here, it's not good to be high on this axis. And um, so you see that here the the yellow part is more or less the global south, uh, where the countries are poor. They have not contributed to biophysical boundaries transgressed, whereas we here the Europeans, um, we are um, more or less uh, the ones who have a high overshoot in terms of environmental problems and, um, uh, and a high level of social uh, thresholds achieved. Now, um, it's, uh, it's now also interesting from uh, the last slide to 2015, how uh, countries have developed. This is China. China was here in the last slide and is here. 
So they have followed more or less the same pathway as the European countries. That in the same moment when uh, social conditions were improved, uh, let's say physical boundary, biophysical boundaries, environmental boundaries were tran transgressed. Germany, for example, has improved in social terms, but no further um, more or less deteriorated uh, the environment as it did a couple of years ago. So um, I think this is more um, a kind of, oops, yeah. Um, a, a slide uh, that is understood by, by politicians. Now, the problem is that in statistics, we have one big indicator, this is the GDP. And the GDP is widely accepted by journalists, by economists, by politicians. And it's well known also out there. So if you say there is low growth or high growth, everybody understands. But for the beyond GDP, we have a kind of cottage industry, which is which uh, provides a variety, heterogeneity of different solutions. And this is why this cottage industry, so to say, cannot compete with the overall standard uh, of, of GDP. And this is uh, the situation which cannot satisfy us in statistics. So um, Eurostat has developed also an SDG indicator report where they used one trick, namely to sort the indicators along a kind of a pathway. You see here this arrow and um, indicators here are relatively close to the target values. Rel and indicators here are relatively far away from uh, target value. So this is a way to communicate and to uh, make transparent um, whether um, developments are uh, moderate progress, moderate movement away, or significant progress. Um, now, um, I think uh, here we could have a stop, right, Katarina? Yes, uh, I don't see questions for the moment. I just mentioned in the chat that you were going to have a break. Otherwise, I think we can go on. Okay. So now uh, this was um, a couple of, let's say, uh, looks into different, um, now to say, um, developments uh, on the user side. The, um, a sustainable development um, request, and also uh, on the statistical side. So this is attempts to overcome the dominance of the GDP and attempts to uh, reduce the high number of 230 indicators to uh, much uh, a fewer, a, a smaller a dashboard, which, which is better better understood by non-statisticians. Now, um, Let's go, let's go to statistics itself. The question is, what is statistics? I think we, we believe that we know what statistics is, but if you read this article by David Hand, uh, you, would, you, will, um, you will already start thinking uh, that our beliefs are a little bit too narrow. And um, this is uh, a more or less a path that I, I would like to follow. And the first, first sentence from my side is statistics is a product. It's an artifact, uh, so it's a product like a mobile phone or like a car or like a piece of bread or like a good meal. Uh, so it is produced. Um, and when something is produced, then it follows a design. And this is the case uh, also for statistics. Uh, statistics are products with a design and the design um, is a function of conventions. So uh, whatever we do in statistics, and in particular in official statistics uh, or in public statistics, um, it's based on conventions. In the best possible way, uh, there is a convention which is called a UN statistical standard. Then, then we can say this is super mature and well-developed, uh, but already the question, what is, what is it that a statistical office is going to measure or is supposed to measure is a question of convention. Uh, because uh, every uh, measurement costs a lot of money and what is in the statistical measurement program um, takes a place in the budget and it does not allow other uh, surveys to be included. 
So the first convention is the, the statistical work program. And then the second convention is, uh, so the what? The second convention is the how, how do we measure? Um, so there are a lot of conventions out there um, uh, which determine uh, what is um, part of a statistical yearbook or a website of a statistical office. So if you look at this from this perspective, then statistics um, is based on five dimensions or five, uh, how to say, uh, inputs and ingredients. Uh, first and foremost, of course, statistics is based on good mathematical statistical methodology, clear. Uh, I think that nobody would have a doubt that this is the case. Uh, more and more, of course, what counts since the 1970s, 80s is uh, that we have also a modern technology, good computer, IT, algorithms, artificial intelligence, that we have reliable data sources, uh, and uh, that we have a super efficient processing method. So not the classical, uh, to say, single processes of production in statistical offices, so the so-called spaghetti bowl, uh, but that we have a modern uh, way of producing statistics, what is called um, uh, trustworthy smart statistics. Um, the third one is um, that we have to understand that statistics is be also based on an infrastructure. So this is like the railways uh, and the infrastructure needs to be maintained, needs to be modernized, need, needs to be standardized. The infrastructure needs to be compatible with infrastructure in neighborhood countries in order to compare things and so forth. Uh, the fourth element is language. Statistics, shall be, must be a common language between producers and users. When I started with statistics, this was not understood. So the end of the story of a production line was the table which was published, full stop. Uh, but now we say um, good statistics is fit for purpose. And if it, if it is this, uh, the fit for purpose principle, then the users have to decide whether uh, statistics are good for them. Uh, lastly, and I, this is part of my, my next uh, slides, is that uh, we have to also uh, to have statistics which are based on values, ethics, and integrity. Okay. Um, there is a very famous book of Hans Rosling, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, I can really recommend to read the book. This is Factfulness, and uh, he has a lot of good examples what statistics can tell you about the world uh, when we were too pessimistic or when we normally are too pessimistic um, because facts can tell us uh, much more the truth about um, the, the situation globally. Uh, on the other hand, we have Hannah Arendt. Uh, I guess Hannah Arendt uh, does not need to be introduced. A very famous person in the 1950s and 60s. And uh, she has said, factual truth is political by nature. Facts and opinions, though they must be kept apart, are not antagonistic to each other. They belong to the same realm. I do not continue with the, um, with the text, but it's very important to understand that the facts we produce, they are, in a certain way, they are political. Uh, we, they are not abstract. They are not the truth. They are products with a political uh, message and a political meaning. Uh, and this is where the relevance come in and where the dangers come in. And um, if you ask yourself, where, is this, where are these facts on an information quality scale? Then you see they are here in zone one, true statement. This is verified facts. Then we have a second zone, distorted statements, framing, selected facts, unsubstantiated statements, these are only rumors and so forth, and down to fake news. This is the, let's say, uh, the well-known example uh, that we have seen from the last, uh, the previous um, um, US uh, president, for example. Now, 
if we take this scale, then we can ask ourselves, okay, we are supposed to be here, verified facts, but then the question comes, what are facts and what is verification? How could we verify that facts are good? And this brings us to a deeper understanding uh, of, um, let's say, a description of Alain de Roiser, who has uh, introduced more or less a kind of sociology of statistics. And he has said to quantify is not the same as to measure. To measure is you have a measurement stick and you measure the size of a tree or of, um, let's say, of a river or of a car. To quantify in socioeconomic um, uh, um, objects um, means uh, that you have firstly um, to start with a question, what is it that I would like to quantify? And then to transform this kind of ideotype into a kind of measurement quantification method. So it's a two-step approach. Um, sorry, it's a two-step two approach. Um, and this two-step approach, as we can see in statistical offices, uh, introduces then a kind of production line with basic statistics. This is the quantification, properly speaking, making of numbers, surveys. Um, the outcome of the, uh, of the surveys, this one, this is already something where we have to fix a couple of problems and we have to impute also. And then we have more complex constructions and models like national accounts or indicators. And it's extremely important to distinguish these three levels because they are different in culture, they are different in quality regimes, um, and they are absolutely not the same. So if we talk about statistics, um, we have to distinguish different uh, segments of statistics in the production process. Now, finally, uh, we can look at this. Facts are products. Uh, they are constructed, but we need to make them objective and neutral, good quality. And for the quality to be very good, uh, we have to look at codification and verification. What are the possibilities there? And finally, we come to the contract between the statistical institute and the society, the political regime, the rulers, and they give uh, they have to give firstly money and a mandate to the statistical office, a social mandate. And uh, they have to give a license. Uh, so you are allowed to conduct this survey, for example, or you are allowed to merge data uh, in under specific conditions. So, um, and this is more or less what has to come together in order to make uh, statistical facts constructed, but objective and of high quality. So we need to talk about values here and attitudes. We need to talk about governance and quality management here. And we need to talk about integrity and governance of the entire state, the society here. And only if all these conditions are fulfilled, uh, then we have good statistics. So it's not just methodology, it's much more complicated. Now, um, what is sometimes uh, heard in the media or in, in discussions on LinkedIn, Twitter or wherever, um, is that people say um, um, politics should be data-driven or decisions should be data-driven. This reads as if the data are first and that there is a kind of automatism uh, only looking at the data without any kind of concept that the pure data plus a kind of algorithm then lead to a decision in an automated way. This is, of course, nonsense. Already in the 1970s, George Box has said, when we produce statistics, it's always a kind of back and forth between induction and uh, deduction and induction. So we start with an hypothesis, a model, a theory, an idea. Then we de develop a first version of a kind of data collection and data evaluation. Then we learn that this is not good enough. We have a second version and so forth. So uh, in, in statistical offices, we are always in this loop of learning. 
So user needs lead to data sources, production processes, statistical methods. We learn in the next phase, we come closer to maybe uh, reverse new user needs. And this is done year by year, quarter by year, quarter or every five or 10 years. Um, and this is how we work. So it's, um, it's not straightforward. And this is where my motorcycle comes in. Um, because the book that one has to read about quality is this Robert Piercyk, Sen, or the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. If you read this book, you understand that quality is not something that you can explain, uh, but that you have to appreciate, to learn with experience, practical experience. And um, this motorcycle is then moving here and trying to not touch one of the borderlines. One, so actuality, precision, response burden. So it, it, you have to keep your uh, statistical motorcycle on the road, uh, not uh, hitting, for example, um, the response burden threshold, because then you would fail, or the relevance uh, threshold. And this is something uh, that you learn when you go into official statistics. Of course, there is guidance. And the guidance here is twofold. On the, in the first place, we have here ethical guidance. This is the Declaration on Professional Ethics of the International Statistical Institute. And this is the guidance uh, which is uh, more on governance, European Statistics Code of Practice, the fundamental principles of official statistics, and for example, the OECD Good Statistical Practice um, Guidance. I will briefly introduce now two of them. Um, but firstly, we have to look at some recent challenges in the last uh, one, two, three years. Um, and one of the challenges is uh, the appearance of big data and of uh, computer intensive techniques, so artificial intelligence. Uh, um, and algorithms, uh, because um, these change the way statistics is produced and uh, we have to really adapt um, our uh, ethics, values, and also uh, the good, um, uh, good quality um, uh, governance uh, guidance to include also these new, newer data and newer methods. Um, we have seen a couple of integrity and independence problems in various regions and states. In Europe, the most, let's say, well-known example is the one of Greece. Uh, this is Andreas Jorgius' case um, where he was condemned be because he was producing correct statistics in Greece some uh, 12 years ago. Uh, then, sorry, we have changes in the task and role of public statistics from statistics which are produced in offices, as definition, to statistics which are for the public good. So not necessarily produced in the statistical office, but with the same quality standard. Um, and new services which are needed for the digital society. I just mentioned the data stewardship. Um, and then, of course, ethical principles and standards need to be included. And this is what I currently do here in my webinar uh, in training and education and statistical literacy. Quickly going to ethics, what does it mean? It basically means responsibility. So whatever we do as statisticians, we are responsible for the outcomes of our work. And this is exactly the same as for other professions, for medical doctors, engineers, uh, politicians, journalists. We all are responsible for what we produce. And uh, this is the guiding, uh, more or less, line of the ISI ethics. Uh, they say uh, you are responsible towards the society, your employer, colleagues, subjects. And um, in order to make this a little bit more uh, tangible, the ISI values are broken down to three types of values. The first are a cluster of um, 
values which are hanging together with respect, respectfulness. The second is professionalism. And the third is truthfulness and integrity. Now, um, if you look at all of them, uh, then you may come to the idea that it's impossible to uh, follow all these principles um, in, in a concrete case. And this is, uh, this is true. Uh, because all these principles, they should guide you to a kind of reflexive approach when you are in a situation to work in a statistical project for an employer, for a project manager, for the society, uh, that you bear these principles in mind and uh, have also practical knowledge on what could happen, um, for example, um, maintaining the confidence in statistics. What could happen if you misbehave here? Uh, what is a concrete case in, let's say, uh, which is uh, threatening the maintenance of confidence in statistics? Or um, let's say communication, uh, let me see, uh, avoiding preempted outcomes. This is certainly something that is uh, very clear um, that you have to be careful in the interpretation of uh, what what your outcome is and that you are not repeating uh, what your assumption has been uh, when you started with a project. So all of these things are not to-dos, but they are uh, helpful reminders for a kind of reflexive approach to your own work. There is a board uh, and I am, as I was, as it was said at the beginning, I'm the chair of this board, the ISI Advisory Board on Ethics. And uh, we have a couple of people from different, uh, let's say, parts of the world and uh, different um, parts of the ISI family uh, who look into cases and try to improve the knowledge on ethics worldwide. And this is what we will do in the forthcoming <clears throat> Ottawa World Statistics Congress 2023. There are a couple of sessions here, statistical learning, validating the independence integrity of statistics around the world, um, ch challenges for developing countries, um, do principles and ethics need to be adjusted to national circumstances, uh, and <clears throat> a workshop on the revision of the ethical principle. <laughs> Just an example, uh, what we will introduce is a kind of um, guidance for trustworthy artificial intelligence as it is here developed by uh, as an example by Paolo Giudici um, and there, there are new principles now which have to be uh, integrated. Uh, the other side is now good governance uh, then we come closer to the European statistical system so the basic uh, while ethics is for the individual professional the statistician uh, good governance uh, principles are for the institution. They are for the research institute, for the statistical institute, whatever. And they cover the whole data value chain from identification, um, uh, process, collect, process, analyze, release, disseminate, and so forth, until feedback, production, and use. So, in principle, the whole data value chain is subject of a good quality management standard. And this was the intention of um, the development of the European Statistics Code of Practice. I do not have to go in, into this in detail because I think it, it's part of the EMOS program. Uh, but I think one can proudly say that um, the European Statistics Code of Practice is the code for statistical process worldwide. So it's, it's really widely used also outside of Europe. And it is more or less, it gives, it has given guidance also for the, the, the OECD standard, the um, standard of the World Bank, um, and so forth. So it's used in Africa, uh, in the Mediterranean countries. Um, and I think it's, it's really mature. And it's not only a Bible, as you can see here, but behind the Bible, there is a kind of um, quality uh, verification regime with peer reviews. Uh, quality reports. So a lot of things which are exactly following what is the quality management 
um, how to say, approach in the industry. So it's a kind of industrial quality management, total quality, total quality management approach for the industry called official statistics. Now, uh, at the UN level, we have a similar, uh, uh, say, pair of commandments, 10 commandments. They are called the UN Fundamental Principles of Official Statistics. They are by far not that detailed as the European one, and they are not legally binding. However, uh, they have been uh, adopted um, by uh, the UN General Assembly. Uh, so they are, in a way, they are also um, legally binding, and they will be celebrated in a couple of weeks uh, because they celebrate their, I think, 35th birthday. Now, uh, quickly coming to the end, two points which are close to my heart. The first one is literacy, uh, that in literacy, we have to go beyond skills and technology. And uh, what I mean is here, uh, that in good statistical literacy, um, we have firstly to understand what I've tried to explain now, that statistical production is an industry, a process which sh shall be managed in the best possible way, namely as a total quality management. And therefore you need to learn, for example, by reading W.E. Deming, what total quality management is. Um, then, the so, sorry. Um, the second one is, what is statistics role in the public discourse? This is the sociology of statistics. And here we have also good textbooks. Ah, shit. Uh, Alain de Roisier, Theodore Porter, or uh, in a more broad way, uh, Sheila Yazanov. But I think all of these books should be part of a statistical training program. And last, but not least, uh, statistical literacy itself. Katharina Schuller um, is uh, currently in a kind of attempt to standardize also the curricula uh, for statistical training um, because it, it should uh, include knowledge, aptitudes, skills, motivation, and attitudes in all stages of the knowledge creation process. So I think we will have a a data literacy framework and standard quite um, near from now. And all of this shall then be covered in a good training. It's not statistical skills, numerical skills, technical skills only, but logic, theory, practice, context, and all of that is important to be captured by statistics. And there are now also good tools out there. For example, this one, um, this is something we know from our chemical classes in, at school, a periodic table, but now the periodic table includes not chemicals, but uh, let's say um, important elements for good statistics. And if you go to the website and click, then behind each of these boxes, you will find guidance um, what you should do there, data licensing, principles, contract and data sharing agreements, data stewards, and so forth. So this is the wide panoply of um, the statistics um, uh, uh, out there. Now, last, lastly, I will come back to statistics and politics uh, and let's say the social discourse. And for me, it's important to say that trust in statistics is different from blind faith. So we cannot expect that people out there, citizens, uh, they, that they simply believe that our data are good of good quality. No, this is not how it works. Uh, trust is built on knowledge and experience. So we have to prove that they can trust us. And therefore, I think um, it's the same for politicians. Um, value generation uh, on the side of the producers and value appreciation on the side of users, they are more or less um, interacting. Uh, if one of these things fails or is too little, uh, then we are in a kind of vicious loop and the whole thing will collapse. And so I think we have to really to um, look at ways of improving this kind of circular uh, element. And, and therefore, I think strengthening a data culture um, is then including four types of um, 
of elements, and I will quickly go through them. Understanding the making of the state. This is sociology of statistics. I think this is by far too little in our education programs, because if, if you really understand the sociology of quantification, then you behave in a different way. The second is bridging the gaps. Um, this is the language uh, that we have to uh, use a kind of language that we have to use communication skills that we have to work with a data journalist, for example, um, with data journalists that we involve citizens in the design and production of statistics from the very beginning um, that we have to open ourselves, which will help us to bridge the gaps between statistical producers and their users. Um, data literacy, I've already mentioned. Um, we have to develop an adequate structure of educational programs, uh, which includes also the values and attitudes. And last but not least, um, uh, we have to advocate our case. So to advocate for the inclusion of statistical expertise in expert policy bodies. This is quite important, and we have not, not to be shy or to shy away from doing this. Um, our friends are data journalists. They understand our, uh, our business, and they can really help us to communicate in a better way. Um, and we, we could have done better in the beginning of COVID-19 uh, COVID in the 20, year 2020 and 2021, um, if we really uh, were better prepared um, and uh, prepared to compile evidence um, on, on all of this. So, uh, and if politicians abuse statistics, then we have to speak up. We have to defend against unethical behavior, even if this is tricky and sometimes dangerous for us as statisticians. But it's, but it's not an option to, to be silent if uh, statistics are misused, misinterpreted, uh, then we have to speak up. That's very important for us. So uh, last slide, uh, we as a community of statisticians, um, we have to be more proactive. Uh, we have to think ahead uh, what will be the upcoming critical transformation processes in order for us to be better prepared than for COVID. Uh, so that we now start really to develop the new uh, products, the new services. We have a lot to offer in terms of possible solutions, but if we have a lot to offer, then it comes with responsibility and our ethical, uh, our ethical responsibility is really to go ahead and dig deeper than we have did so far, than we have done so far. Um, so, muchas gracias, muito obrigado, vielen Dank, thank you, merci bien. Grazie. I forgot, grazie. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Walter. So actually we received uh, uh, some questions in the meanwhile. And I think that you already addressed a couple of them that I'm going to, to read to you because they're about communicating statistics. So yeah. the first one um, is how do you communicate statistics? We have to produce objective statistics. This is why they mostly come with caveats. But how do you communicate all of this? Most of the time, politics and media take the numbers without the caveats. But in the case of environmental statistics, these caveats are important and decision making should take them into account. And the mm -hmm. second one is related. So I'm reading also this being able to communicate statistical results to the public is, of course, of fundamental importance. But surveys are becoming more and more complex. And so are analysis, machine learning methods, for example. Do you see possible initiatives to maintain communication between statisticians and people? There is something that, uh, yeah, you already maybe addressed, but if you want to add something. Uh, yes, I think um, th this is um, this this um, is extremely important. Both questions are extremely important, not only for environment statistics, yeah, uh, because um, co communication is tricky in every case of statistics. So um, you have really to um, make little steps 
in order to find out where is the red line between improving communication and uh, let's say um, uh, increasing the number of um, misinterpretations. And, and there might be a kind of optimum, uh, but I think uh, in the past we have been too shy and too conservative, so to say. Um, and, and we have uh, many, many, many examples uh, that can um, that that can help us to understand how good communication uh, is there to help users to take the message out of of the data, the main message out of the data, which are not the footnotes, but the main message. Uh, so it, it, it just um, switch to, uh, for example, two two cases. The first is um, uh, something with uh, risk. If you um, take, for example, um, the communication of thunderstorms in Florida, so these big hurricanes in September or uh, August, September, um, then of course you can overload people in Florida or in Texas with all the information and footnotes, but then they will stop reading. But if, the, if, if your intention is to make them read and to understand uh, what the main, um, what the main uh, message of your calculation is, then you have to reduce the number of pathways to two, three, four scenarios, which is courageous from the side of a statist statistician, uh, but it's the only way to, to, re to reach the people. Um, and, and the second is uh, these interactive tools so that people can play with data. So for example, if you communicate, this is what comes to my mind, um, something complicated like, like inflation, which is a hot issue at the, at the, at the moment, uh, then you can make people understand uh, if you give them tools to turn up and down their own, um, how to say, consumption pattern. So if they smoke or don't, don't smoke, it will have an impact on, on their personal, how to say, inflation calculator. And there are a lot of tools out there uh, um, which can help us really to communicate in such a way that people understand the main message and the footnotes. So it's not necessarily a, a contradiction. Uh, last but not least, uh, what is a footnote and what is not a footnote <laughs> is a question of culture. Uh, for example, if you take an early estimate, a now cast, yeah, a now cast for the GDP, uh, then this was impossible to be done in Europe some 10 years ago, uh, because every culture would say, no, 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 this is not for the statistical office, this is for the uh, research institute. Uh, but culture has changed. And now we, are, we have a situation where statistical offices are even supposed to come up with these data. So it's not a fixed line. Um, we have to communicate. This is a flow of communication and not a black and white. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have other questions. Two, I would again read two together because maybe they are a little related. So one is uh, about artificial intelligence. If according to you is a danger or an enable, enable for official statistics. Uh, and another one instead is a more general, I mean, uh, thank you for the interest presentation. And you say developing a real, real, reliable products in official statistics takes a lot of time, not to mention all the legal procedures involved. Uh, reliable and comparable European statistics do require a lot of work and harmonization standards, many of which you mentioned. At the same time, official statistics should be more responsive to new and changing needs. How to resolve these conflicting goals? Reducing standards does not seem to be a good solution. So maybe these two questions about innovation and how it relates, I guess, with the, of course, the standard of official statistics. Okay, so art artificial intelligence, uh, it's solution or threat. <laughs> it's both, it's both. Yeah. Um, I think uh, if, uh, if we are naive, then it's more a threat. And if we smart, it's more a solution. I think, um, again, coming to one of the cases where um, artificial intelligence can help us and big data uh, going to inflation calculation, so, so far, the price information uh, is collected by 
price, uh, let's say, collecting people out there who go to the shops and uh, look at the, the, let's say, milk, chocolate and bread and how far the prices have changed. Mm -hmm. But but this is not the future. The future will be scanner data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and scanner data, however, they come with a completely different context. Um, and it does not make sense to assume that we can substitute one-to-one -one a price collector in shops by scanner data by the same shop. This does not make sense. So the whole design has to change for, for statistics. So we have to rethink the whole survey methodology um, and uh, to, the, the entire, um, how to say, production line will have to be changed, including artificial intelligence, uh, so-called algorithms, big data uh, being included. And, and this is trusted smart statistics, what it means. It's not a naive one-to-one um, -one, um, uh, exchange. It's, uh, it, it's really a, a challenge for the business process and a complete redesign of statistics. And even, and, and I know of course that uh, we are, there are good reasons to be conservative as a statistician, but you can overdo this. Uh, if you wait too long, um, mm -hmm. and I have a little bit the, the um, how to say, the impression that we are waiting too long, uh, that uh, scanner data, for example, they are used, I, last week I was, uh, having a speak at the University of Kiel, and they told me we are we are playing with Canada data, but there is it's very difficult to speak with um, the statistical office because they don't understand us uh, because they just want to have exactly the same data as they have, and this is not possible. So for Hartmut, hello Hartmut, uh, hi. Um, yes, uh, the conflicting goals. The conflicting goals are there. Um, if you have uh, a fixed budget, then they are conflicting. And um, I think the, uh, the budget line, if it, if it is impossible to have additional, how to say, money for experiments for the laboratories in statistics, then we've got a problem. And the priority setting between, let's say, traditional and future-oriented statistics becomes extremely hard, as I know, uh, because the traditional statistics, they have always good arguments um, to defend themselves. Uh, but the new incoming statistics, though they are extremely important, they don't have their defenders and their advocates. So at the end, such kind of uh, choice between old and new, uh, let's say traditional and experimental, uh, is to the detriment of the newer ones. And it leads to a kind of betonization of the statistical program. And this mu must not be a solution. This, I think, is not an option. Thank you. And we have also this other question, I think a clarification. Uh, ready from my point of view, data are always created in a specific context. How do you address this fact, please? Uh, I think I have done this uh, in terms of from my beginning. The context is the beginning. The context is not the end. So um, I think mm, the alpha, alpha omega uh, allegoration is the context is the alpha. You start with uh, your issue, with a question. Yeah, the question. And then you, the first step is to translate this question into a kind of ideal type, which uh, let's say, quoting Max Weber, uh, which might be uh, translatable again into a kind of statistical method. But the first thing is that we have to define what is it that we would like to quantify? Uh, is it growth? Is it progress? Is it poverty? Is it inflation? Um, and what is the context? What is the, the use of our data? And, and then once we know this, um, we are looking for data, methods, algorithms, techniques, processes. Okay. Context comes first. Thank you. Yeah. 
So there, <laughs> thank you for these replies. I think we are running out of time. Uh, I don't see any question. I, I would like to ask you a very general question for the EMOS. So any specific suggestion for us as professor of the EMOS or also for our students of the EMOS? What should we do <laughs> to, to do our best in this framework? Um, well, and in the framework, I think um, uh, if I, I have given some some hints, huh? so mm -hmm. um, um, make yourself knowledge knowledgeable about um, total quality management. I think that's important. So think like an industry manager uh, first. And second is um, make yourself knowledgeable about the sociology of quantification. So this is then Alain de Roiser, Theodore, Theodore Porter, uh, as two textbooks, which I would like to recommend besides my own one, mm -hmm. um, to, to be read. So I think it's really uh, to, to put people, students and, your, and ourselves into a kind of reflexive mode, Mm -hmm. um, which always um, ask ourselves, what are we doing here? What is it good for? Um, yeah. Where are the limits? Where are the risks and side effects? Um, so the good side and also the risks. Um, yeah. and, and once we have understood this in a, in a better way, we are better prepared. Okay, thank you. So I think it's time to close. I don't see other questions. So thank you, Walter. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. And of course, many thanks also to all our participants who joined us today. Uh, as participants, you are invited to fill in a short survey about today's webinar. The survey will open in your browser uh, just after the end of this Zoom meeting. If you don't have time right now, you will receive a link by email to fill in the survey later. We really appreciate your feedback to further improve uh, the EMOS webinars. Uh, our next webinar is scheduled on February 22, 22nd, sorry, when Lucia Quaglietti from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development will be presenting on uh, uh, good value change measurement. Uh, for this and for future webinars, please keep an eye for our website. Uh, emos-events.com. So thank you again, Professor Adelmacher, for contributing with this very interesting uh, webinar. And of course, as, as you already mentioned also, uh, the slides will be available for further reference on uh, our website. So thank you and have, have a nice evening to everybody.